Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from a trio of thrilling countries in Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium. Hello. And two from a trio of thrilling countries in Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium. Hello. And Cara. Hello from Germany. And I'm your host, Fen. I guess hello from the Baltic Sea. Uh, today we're going from farm to table with a look at the 2021. Uh, today we're going from farm to table with a look at the 2021 release Stardew Valley. Then we're going to go back a little bit in time to a card drafting classic with Sushi Go, and finally we're going all the way back to the previous millennium with a game that launched an entire career, Ponanza. But before we get into that, we'll have our little last standy catch up. So what's been up with you, Alexis? I've not played uh, that much stuff, but I'm planning to play two more um, a quick RPG uh, murder mystery uh, that I've cooked up, uh, and I'm really excited for for that. I've also um, an AI that make pictures, or uh, if you give it uh, give it a prompt, uh, there's a lot of them at the moment that uh, that people are looking at. It, but uh, Midjourney is the one that's a little bit more uh, artistic in the way that it uh, it does things. If you want to make it something that looks real, it's a bit harder, but it works perfectly for RPG stuff, for making like cards to anybody that plays uh, RPG and that want to um, uh, have homemade illustration for the campaigns, but don't want to uh, necessarily pay an artist to illustrate every moment, but just need uh, some quick illustration. Um, really, really interesting as a as a concept, even though there's yeah. a lot of uh, is it uh, is it good for the art world? That's exactly what I was going to say is um, I bet artists were not very high up amongst the people who thought that robots were going to take their jobs. Yeah. Uh, AI is doing it faster than anyone else. A, a lot of uh, artists that I, that I know really good idea and inspiration for composition. It gives them uh, a tool that uh, allows them to make texture and stuff like that uh, in, in interesting and unusual ways. For example, the creator of Ultraviolet Grassland, which is a game that I talk about constantly, uh, somehow, uh, recently made a few queries onto the, the AI and then de uh, after that uh, turned them into illustration for his book by like redrawing them in his style. Um, and it looks really cool. Uh, I, I'll post a couple of them on the, onto the Discord because I think it's very interesting. Like obviously, um, interesting like obviously um there's a it, it's uh i would say perfectly legitimate to have concern about the the fear that an ai might replace artists especially with bigger companies that might not see the point in paying uh, actual artists if they can do it via an ai that was the point in paying uh, actual artists if they can do it via an ai that was going to be exactly my point it's not so yeah. much like like you're talking about there is tools if artists are using this ai art as a tool fantastic yeah that's yeah, great exactly. it's helping but i what we see with um companies is wherever they can replace people with machines the problem i think and where people will need to to figure out ways especially since those ai uh inspire themselves from other artists uh like they they basically like uh, they're fed the database of image and there's there's like legitimate question about you know if an ai feeds itself on the art of a lead like their art but you know the the artist that that made that art is not being paid or being uh remunerated from it like that's that's i, I definitely understand the concerns there and i think that there's definitely like uh some things that need to be uh questions but uh, outside of that, like the technologies, outside of that, like the technologies, pretty impressive and pretty um, uh, amazing to, to play with. Yeah. Uh, so definitely something to to keep an eye on. And if you you make RPG and you're doing stuff just for yourself and your little table, uh, have a look at it because uh, you won't hurt anybody with that. Yeah, I think that's a good point, especially if you won't hurt anybody with that. Yeah, I think that's a good point, especially since you know. Um one could say hey why don't you just pay an artist to do it for you but realistically speaking um i don't think a lot of people have the money to pay an artist to have their characters yeah. drawn yeah. What? money to pay an artist to have their characters yeah. drawn yeah. What? 
when, when I play a campaign, uh, I have a lot of friends who are artists, so usually they have they make their own illustration because they they read it. But when I ma make a campaign, sometimes I will pay an artist to make like one big illustration of a cool moment of the campaign to kind of a, a nice little souvenir or something like a, a cool location of a, a, a fun scene or maybe a character that was specifically uh, interesting. But obviously, not everybody is going to to want to put that. Uh, a hundred or two hundred euros into into illustrating uh, their campaign, and especially like a hundred euro for every single moment or every item that they find. But with an AI, you can find something that will be like that will fit exactly what you want, and not mm -hmm. just rely on uh, outside art. Yeah, um, yeah, that's uh, that's, that's what I was thinking about because um, part of the reason I stopped making custom content, is not the sole sole reason, but part of it was. Um, I, I don't, didn't want to take art from various places anymore, even though I was digitally altering a lot of it. Um, and uh, I couldn't afford to pay an artist to get things done. Like, you know, I had I had some people, I, like, have a go at me for stopping creating stuff. Some people, I, like, have a go at me for stopping creating stuff. And I was like, look, and I, ca I can't get an artist. Like... You know, I had one one guy approach me and said, "Oh, I do some work for your stuff. It'd be fantastic." And I said, "Okay, um, that how much do you charge?" And he went, "Oh, no, no, I'll just do it." And I was like, "No, no, you need to go away and think about a price." No, no, I'll just do it. And I was like, "No, no, you need to go away and think about a price and come back to me, um, because I'm not just taking the art for your exposure. That's no." Uh, no 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 i wouldn't want that you know if somebody approaches me and says oh, hi we're doing this game can you take a look at it all and play test it I, i'm like i'm not doing this unless i get some professional a professional and that kind of stuff yeah definitely it, it, every every walk uh, deserves uh deserves to be paid for absolutely um, in the case of mid journey uh, every uh the, the art that you uh, you query for it you have all you have the full rights for it and the only um uh, rules that they have is that it's a good policy uh, on their yeah. end. Well, um, it, they have to. We've seen where pay, uh, where NFTs have gone. It's just a oh, yeah, yeah, Ponzi yeah. scheme, basically. Definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, on um, uh, also just to finish closing this point, I wasn't uh, planning to have it running for this long, but um, uh, we've seen for RPG and like homemade contents that is sold for uh, not too much money on. Um, uh, drive through that's come and stuff like that uh illustrated with um ai generated art in ai generated art because for indie stuff that is a great uh, tool that allows them to uh, either uh, a picture that um they they found somewhere and don't have the right for or a picture that they paid for and will make their uh module uh more costly for for indie stuff like it's it's been um I think that for that, it's going to be a very useful tool and it is yeah, already some time that's my, my light. Yeah, that, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to put one last point on a button in respect to that, uh, which is, uh, I think that under that context, if you're a small, it's one, one, one man band or you're a tiny company just starting out, um, I think that's fine. Or you're even just doing it for free release. You know, some people do what fan fine. Or you're even just doing it for free release. You know, some people do what fanzines or whatever, uh, fan content. I think all of that's fantastic. I just, I, I don't like it when big companies do what they always do, which is they start using it as well. Um, we've seen that with Kickstarter. Like Kickstarter, if you were going to look at it, what it's supposed to be doing, it, like Kickstarter, if you were going to look at it, what it's supposed to be doing, it's hey, I I'm new. This is my idea. Can you help me get it out there? And then off I go on my feet, and I can do my thing. Instead, it, you know, instead it's become back to the well, back to the well, and the well. I say the well's dry now. It's pretty close to dry, and the well. I say the well's dry now. It's pretty close to dry, but I don't want to see that happening. It could ruin it for everyone, which is what's happened with crowdfunding. Crowdfunding has kind of been ruined through a combination of world uh, events and situations nobody can deal with couldn't really foresee them coming well maybe you could deal with couldn't really foresee them coming well maybe you could and you can sit the guy told you so but nobody in charge saw them coming and um you know like I, i'm at the point now where i i literally look at a kickstarter and i go do you have your distribution listed and have you have you put anything up before and i sometimes i'll go i'm not i'm not backing it anything up before and I, sometimes I'll go, I'm not, I'm not backing it. 
Um, yeah, I think that it works for small projects and small yeah. ideas, but definitely anything big that goes onto Kickstarter, I'm going to have a very uh, critical look at it. Yeah, yeah. There's. Yeah. Um, I was going to talk about my section. Yeah, um, but I may as well talk about it briefly now. Um, there's Bloodstones, which is Lance. Uh, there's Bloodstone and Bloodstones, just to be confusing. Um, Bloodstone, I think, is a cancelled project, and Bloodstones is a Martin Wallace con project. It's Martin Wallace. What? Why? I, I like Martin Wallace's games, but you're an established name. You don't need to be running on a crowdfunding platform for this. No, that's, yeah. that's why. I've... Out of a smaller project and smaller IDs that need to be on a Kickstarter or crowdfunding platform, it's it yeah. like it it takes space in a, uh, a community that's supposed to be about uh, smaller uh, budget things. Yeah. In any case, yeah, yeah. It, uh, exactly. Cara. It it has, yeah. <laughs> um, that same way, um, yeah. Kara, how have you been doing recently? Um, well, I've been doing better. Um, as I have shared on the Discord, I had um, emotional, psychological problems with having burnout and such, and um, so I was away a while to be treated. Um, so that's nice. That is wonderful. Glad to have you back. Yeah, thank you. I'm also really glad to be back. And also, it, with that being said, just you know, everyone who listens, don't be afraid to ask for help when you have psychological problems. Um, it's the same as when your arm is broken and you go to a doctor to have it fixed. Um, try to get some help. Um, yeah, especially since it's it's something that everybody uh, goes through, and the the only difference is that some people don't uh, walk on it and don't uh, recognize it. Yeah, um, definitely. It's, it's it's like part of the human uh, experience. Uh, anyway, so um, play a couple games. Um, one of which is Stardew Valley, which I will talk about shortly. And um, also, I am planning a, a trip, a vacation, so to say, which is quite new for me because I actually haven't really, I don't know, ten years or so. Um, so looking forward to uh, seeing Gotland. I'm sure it will be fun if the ferry doesn't yeah. sink. Um. Uh, the, the, those ferries are huge. Um, they won't sink. Yeah, I'm, I'm still a little bit afraid of deep water. So I'm, I'm yeah, I, I'll be really curious to see how it works out. <laughs> well, thankfully, there's never been um any horror story based on a tiny uh, on a tiny island nation in um, somewhere called uh, you know the tiny island nation in um, somewhere called uh, you know that you can only access by a ferry that is definitely not a uh, breeding ground for um, uh, pulp uh, pulp book about horror and monsters yeah <laughs> the only monsters here yeah. <laughs> the only monsters here are the tourists. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> well, you will be the real monster, Gara. Is this like some oh. like kind of you know they are more afraid of me than I'm of them? Um. Well, <laughs> it, the, the... Of me than I'm of them. Um. Well, <laughs> it, the the main problem that happens I've talked about this before is we don't have capacity on the island with water and facilities to hold like more than 120,000 people uh, 60,000 people to normal island population it's got past 120,000 people to normal island population it's got past 120,000 this year uh, at the peak periods and it keeps on going up more and more like we residents are told you can't have baths you can't uh, water your lawn or your plants we have, so I, we have to use rainwater um, which, um, which in itself is a nightmare because we've got two breeds of mosquito on the island. It used to just be one, but a very big aggressive one has travelled up from Africa. And uh, it's ideal here, really perfect for them, because it's very wet and then suddenly very, very sunny. You are doing a great... <laughs> Mosqui mosquitoes are everywhere. You just have to uh, live with them. I'm, I'm very allergic to mosquitoes, like very, very allergic. I swell up if I get bitten. So I'm doing fine and there's n virtually none on the property because th they're all enticed to go in the water butt and then when they hatch into the little larvae, I tip, tip them more and that breaks the surface tension and they drown. 
Got no problem killing mosquitoes. Mosquitoes suck. Okay, well, it's a good thing I bought uh, just, you know, yesterday or so, bought a... Um, I wasn't aware that this is a thing until two weeks ago, uh, a, like a pen that heats up at the tip. So basically, if you're being bitten by an insect, activate it, and then for three seconds, it gets heated to 60 degrees Celsius. And thereby it breaks down the proteins which are uh, which compose the venom of the insect oh well that's uh, excellent then you don't need to worry about it at all yeah <laughs> or my dog um they're both the, the the dog equivalent of typo and not not my partner my partner's just typo typo negative i think um and the dog has very very enticing body heat and blood type as well so i rarely get bitten okay i, I keep that in mind so um but um i was just going to say yep the main thing is if it rains they hatch out five days later so it's five days after rain i don't think you're going to get hit by that window so you'll be fine <laughs> okay so um yeah in board game news i received uh, my retail copy of Blood Game News, I received uh, my retail copy of Blood on the Clock Tower and um, now thinking about who I will invite over for a game and um, yeah, really looking forward to that. The unpacking was really interesting and reading through it and such. So to that, the unpacking was really interesting and reading through it and such. So pretty hyped for it. Yeah, it's a very good game. Um, do just you stick with Trouble Brewing for unless it becomes a regular thing you play with a lot of people because sects, sects and violent one that they have are really complex. Yeah, I noticed um, when I you know just skimmed the abilities that it it really ramps up. <laughs> it does. the The mad ability is really fun um, because it throws more disinformation into the whole mm -hmm. thing uh but uh, deduction games uh, uh, in a big deep level uh and they you know this is the first one then yeah um, trouble brewing is fantastic fun because the demon in that is very easy to understand it kills each night and it can kill itself to make one of its other minions become the new demon that's fairly easy to get your hands on and to understand yeah so yeah um yeah, I think that's it uh, for me, except, yeah, tomorrow my uh, role-playing group will uh, come visit and we will play D&D &D again, the old one, 3.5, not D&D &D 5. And, um, mm. yeah, another thing to look forward, D&D &D 5. And, um, mm. yeah, another thing to look forward to. Oh, that sounds nice. good. Sounds like yeah. some, uh, uh, quite, there's... 3.5 still has quite a, f a following. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it it was definitely my favorite version of D&D, um, uh, &D, specifically because my favorite version of D&D, um, uh, &D, specifically because it's where Planescape, um, uh, the, the, the whole um, uh, module is located. Um, I played a lot of uh, adventures in there. So anyway, Fen, what about you? What have you been up to? Right, well, um, I, you know, I always talked about one thing I was going to talk about during Alexis's segment. So all I really have to say is that uh, I picked up Stars of Acarius recently, and it is deserving of the hype it's getting on Board Game Geek. I I wasn't able to really understand. Is it um, story oriented, or is it very mechanical? Okay, so... Because it's been compared to Seven Continents yeah. a lot, but it looks to be a lot more... Um... Let, let, let me just give you the, the game mechanic pitches. So, it's a space with tactical hex-based combat using decks. So you even have the modifier decks, same as Gloomhaven. That's where people compare it to Gloomhaven, because you do scenarios. But that you have ship combat and you have to take into account that like inertia, the ships, when they move, they move a set pattern. If they can't move that far, then you put the ship under stress. A set pattern. If they can't move that far, then you put the ship under stress, which is a nice mechanic. You can do it deliberately as well. Um, and all of the foes are represented by, they have an AI deck that tells you the process to move through to use them. So that's the big, big bulk of the 
thinky portion is it's it's very big bulk of the thinky portion is it's it's very simple it starts you off easy with like have your pilot ability have one weapon have one engine have one of the basic ships here you go and you get to grips with that uh, and then it starts introducing more and more abilities um, so it, it eases you into that complexity engines and four extra abilities um, so the ship combat gets quite crunchy um, which I like you also learn the behaviors of each uh, each ship type the more you play which helps you predict what they're gonna do which so similar to uh, Kingdom Death in that I think the AI in Stars Vicarious is better than Gloomhaven's section where the main ship um, the Sparrow explores around the galaxy after the events occur at the opening section of the game um, and that that feels a little bit like Seventh Continent and they also have some planetary exploration that feels even more like Seventh Continent that feels a lot like it. The rest of the whole thing is you have a storybook that you work through and make your decisions and that's very much think of the Madara storybook structure. So it's kind of like Sleeping Gods smashed together with Gloomhaven, a little bit of Kingdom Death, and a little bit of Midara. Boom. And, you know, space theme. Uh, boom. And, you know, space theme. Uh, it is. It's really cool. The only real downside is once you start playing, the game doesn't have great capacity for people dropping in and out, unlike Gloomhaven. You can do it, but um, you then have to sort of retroactively look at a list of all of the and you then have to sort of retroactively look at a list of all of the benefits that you've gained through the campaign and make sure that they bring their ship up to scratch uh, by improving it. Uh, that's really the only complaint. Um, it is like... I don't play a lot of solo games um, two-handed or multi-handed you know, with multiple characters. This one I feel two-handed or multi-handed you know, with multiple characters. This one I feel very comfortable playing with two characters and I prefer that over one single uh, solo character. Yeah, uh, but that was when I was testing it to play it and get, and get to grips with it. And I'm going to play through the whole campaign and report back on here in probably about half a year. Whole campaign and report back on here in probably about half a year. I've I've hesitated to to, to grab it, but it's very expensive. So it I is. Uh, Pushed it back, but yep. With no, I... relation, maybe uh, maybe that will be my um, uh, Christmas present. <laughs> yeah, I, I do recommend it. I know it's pricey. But I'm seeing a lot of content, and you get and you get branching decisions almost from the very beginning. That the whether they're probably not big branches, but they they lead to different scenarios. Uh, I will say, you absolutely do not need the miniatures box. The standees the game comes with are good enough. I bought the miniatures for the sake of buying them to be able to review them. Um, I want three D ship miniatures. Yeah. So that's uh. That's the main thing, um, really. Apart from that, I've been playing more Arkham Horror. I'm not going to talk about that this time. I might talk a little bit about Dunwich Legacy next time we record, just as a, a brief overview of whether it's worth. And get outside to, to you know feel the morning sun and the dew on all of the grass um, with Kara, who's going to talk about Stardew Valley. Yes, more specifically Stardew Valley, the board game, um, because let me start by saying I love Stardew Valley, the board game. I, I really love Stardew Valley as well, um, and I'm really interested to hear your thoughts. I just want to give you a really quick recommendation to have a look for on video game. Check out, um, is it Dinkum? Yeah, it's called Dinkum. It's from Australian solo developer. It is Stardew Valley. Uh, go ahead. Okay, I'll have to look it up. So, um, now, first of all, um, Stardew Valley the board game is a one to four player um, game, kind of worker placement um, ish, and I to fulfill certain goals, which compose of grandpa letters, um, basically, some things you're uh, late grandfather uh, told you to achieve in your new home in Stardew Valley and uh, the others are so-called bundles, um, tasks um, for the community center. So it gets rebuilt. Um, the game plays over several rounds and each round has three phases. First the season phase where you just flip a season card which tells you, you know, 
basically how the weather is. Uh, it has different effects, you just handle them and then it's done. Then comes the planning phase, in which the players um, discuss among each other who will do what in this turn, in this uh, round, and um, decide where to go. This is also the time when players can exchange items, or time when players can exchange items or um, cro cro crops or whatever they just carry around. Um, so if one has a crop they want to sell, that it, they can give it to another player who's supposed to go shopping. Um, yeah, so that's the planning phase. And then comes the player who's supposed to go shopping. Um, yeah, so that's the planning phase. And then comes the action phase where, uh, beginning with the starting player, everyone does either um, two actions at the place they are standing, or they do one action standing, or they do one action, move to an adjacent place and do a second action there. And that's basically it. There's also the thing, if you move in between actions, you can forage for stuff. But um, yeah, that's the core framework, um, the rule sides in the manual. The rest is explanation of the different actions you can do. Um, I did read online that people find the rulebook quite complicated. I can't agree with that. It's I find it pretty simple. Um, there are well, I wasn't sure at first how it's meant, but um, in general, I think it's pretty easy to learn how to play. Yeah, I think a lot of people. Um, well, not a lot, but I think some people. Uh, complained about really the rulebook complexity because across and this was like their first board game um, so that might be where you've found people complaining or it might just be board gamers being board gamers I don't know I mean one thing I can totally understand when people complain about it um, though I haven't actually seen this complaint <laughs> um, the amount of stuff in the box stuff that's great here I feel like maybe they could have gone with a little less I mean um, there are uh, 12 different types of cards. There are 14 different types of tiles. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that sounds a little bit like a classical problem of over designing and not uh, cutting uh, stuff down. Uh. Yeah, I mean, even the, the double page spread of uh, the starting layout example, it's a lot. <laughs> Huh. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it's a lot. Huh. <laughs> and um, yeah, so, but okay. Um, I mean, they do have this extra tray for a lot of the tiles. Um, so even with all the stuff set up and tear down is somewhat okay. Yeah, um, it's somewhat okay. Yeah, um, now. Um, I'll continue just focusing on the board game for now. Um, let's just imagine there wasn't a computer game um, with the same name. A big critic for me um, is the component quality. Um, I was quite excited when I opened it and that excitement dropped significantly once I held the components in hand because all these tiles and cards, which are made of paper <laughs> or cardboard, because they are all coated in something that's very unnatural. And um, yeah, especially with the theme that doesn't really fit. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm playing a game about starting new in a small town, tending to my farm, and basically all that's, um, yeah. Uh, even the backs, uh, there are two backs to hold tiles. They are, yeah, they are not like linen bags or something. They are clearly plastic, um, synthetic material and not the nice kind. <laughs> so, um, mm. um, anyway, the game itself, um, it's, it's it's kind of weird. And now I, I'll start to, to draw a bridge to the video game. Um, Stardew Valley, the video game, is 
really great. Mm, quite a lot of people really love it. You have your farm, you have the town, you meet people, you make friends, uh, you learn their stories. And um, yes, when starting, play, to, uh, starting to play a game the first time, it can feel like, oh my God, so much to do and so little time um, because the days go by pretty fast, but next day. Yeah? So um, in, in the video game, I never really had the feeling of urgency. Yeah? There was always like, okay, what of the different things I can do do I want to do today? And then I just do it and it's nice and I go to sleep and then the next day comes and I think, okay, what do I want to do today? Plan that takes me a couple days and that's fine. And then I have the calendar with the birthdays of the townsfolk so I can plan ahead and see, oh, uh, their birthday is coming up, so better grab a gift for them, um, stuff like that. And yeah, it's pretty chill. It's nice to be involved in this in this uh, world. And along comes Stardew Valley, the board game, which does not feel like that at all. Um, basically, it's a really tight game. Um, you can't waste turns if you want to win. Um, you can't waste turns if you want to win. Um, this gets underlined by the fact that the designers added one page in the game box with advice on how to play. Um, so there's one page strategies and this on how to play. Um, so there's one page strategies and tips. Yeah, how should you plan your first couple turns? Uh, what should you focus on? What should you not forget? Stuff like that. And that in itself sh shows already. Yeah, it's not a leisurely game. Leisurely game. It's um, mm. um, so there's always so much to do, so little time. Um, the whole four-player thing, I mean, basically, it, I, I don't think the player, because players can't really do their own thing. You always have to plan together your turns. And um, so it, you can also just play alone and take four characters, which is more fun than playing alone with one character, because then you have skills and starting equipment and such. So, um, yeah, and and then you might think, okay, yeah, so uh, once you know how it works, then it's fine, maybe it's just, you know, at the beginning, but then comes the randomness. Um, for example, eat some ore. Um, in one of my games, I actually was very desperate in getting, like, geodes to collect artifacts, which you can get by mining a geode and then taking it to the smith who breaks it open and then you draw something. Um, well, ich, uh, I uh, to the mine and went again and went again and went again and I didn't get geodes um, because it depends on dice rolls. And yes, you there are mitigation mechanisms. Um, like if you have a better pickaxe, you can like if you have a better pickaxe, you can move after having rolled to a different spot, which you didn't roll. Um, but still, there is a lot of thing. There are a lot of things that are just random. Even the the make a friend mechanic. Um, basically, even the the make a friend mechanic. Um, basically, you can make friends by giving them gifts. If you make a friend, you gain one heart. If you make a friend by giving them a gift they specifically like, you gain two hearts. Uh, and if you make a friend, two hearts. Uh, and if you make a friend on their birthday, um, you gain an additional heart. So you can gain one, two or three hearts. However, when you make a friend, you draw a random card and that's the person you meet and if it's not their birthday you are out of have something they like you're out of luck you can't plan ahead uh, it's not like oh i have this thing and i know this character likes it so let's meet them no you have some stuff with you and you just go to the town square and look who you meet and give them a gift um 
Yeah. Then there are item deck. Um, as in the video game, you can marry someone who you've made friends with. However, to marry them, you need an epic item. So you can marry them, with get, which gives you a separate pawn, so you can make more actions. Uh, which is you can make more actions, uh, which is pretty great. But there are 17 epic items in the deck, and during my plays, at most, I drew five of these cards. So um, there isn't a big chance of actually getting this one item you need to marry someone. There isn't a big chance of actually getting this one item you need to marry someone. Yeah, and and. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the game is riddled with stuff like that. And so you you race against the clock, um, you can't waste any turns and actions, you can't waste any turns and actions, only to then be dependent on luck. So um, I think if the game was themed in any other way, I would like it more. And I was excited for a board game adaptation and it just feels like someone who was told what players can do in Stardew Valley tried to create a game with all these options inside without having any idea how the video game feels. I was going to talk about this after, but this seems like a good point to interject this. Uh, I've actually looked up who designed this game. Um, it was published by Concerned Ape, who are, or who is, as you, I think you know, the, the guy who made um, Stardew Valley. Um, he's the lead designer on this board game as well. So I, I, I attached to this and most of them are first time board game designers. Um, a couple have other games on their list. So I, I think it might be the opposite. I think this might be... Um, video game designers not quite getting how to adapt it into a board game. Maybe. Um, and actually, designers on Board Game Geek are Eric Barone and Cole Medeiros. And I think uh, this Eric Barone is Cornered Ape. Yeah. And in the game itself, he's only credited as based on Stardew Valley um, credit for him. And as designed by this, only Cole Medeiros. So, um, I, I'm yeah. I don't know in how far the creator of the video game was actually involved in doing mm. this. <laughs> well, uh, Cole has everyone who's credited, and he's designed two other games. Um, so I wonder if he's a friend. Yeah. I mean, he has a good rhythm. He designs one game every seven years. Um, his first game was from 2007, then 2014, and then 2021. Um, kind of like a Rumpelstiltskin Dragon uh, Groundhog Day type entity. You know, he goes to sleep, and then on the seventh year, he wakes up and lays a board game, and then goes back to sleep. I, I played the game once uh, last year, and that was kind of my um kind of my um my impression too that it was very over designed and it felt a little bit like um uh, like a caverna but um but by by someone with less less experience because caverna is very good but it it uh, mixes a lot of very different uh systems very good but it it uh, mixes a lot of very different uh systems and it works but it's already a bit um uh, a bit much i'm going to say and it kind of feels like they they took the, their inspiration uh of something that was very complicated and and maybe it kind of felt like they did very complicated and and maybe it kind of felt like they didn't quite have the chops to to tie it up together and make it feel whole and it kind of feels like uh, the, the way that i played it at least kind of felt like ver very different uh concept and ideas like tied together which is it's it's a bit like the um, uh, Stardew, it's like the um, uh, Stardew Valley itself. You can do a lot of different things into the game, but they are whole like they feel whole and they feel uh, thematically uh, linked because it's a very chill and relaxing game. While here it kind of feels like they're they're f 
fight each uh, each mechanic fights each other uh, in certain ways at least uh, in certain ways at least that's that's my feeling with only one game played yeah i mean i look at the board and i can see obviously that's that's star new valley and they've kept the layout and they've tried to involve everything you can do in the town but i feel like for me at least they've neglected the element i like the most which is building the farm there's no like layout of farm you don't put some crops in and have some mechanics to see how many of them succeed visually like a tile laying build your own farm board is there uh, a German Euro game about crop rotation? That seems like a game that needs to be made by uh, by some uh, German designer. I think there is um, one. I... Uh, um, and I, I find it really interesting. Just uh, a few days ago, I saw a discussion on Twitter where someone um, basically also said they didn't like the game and gave a lot of reasons for it. And it, it started a discussion of who this game is for. And the interesting thing is to be for because when you look at it you see stardew valley so it seems like this game is for the people who like the video game however if you played it you notice it's completely different from the video game so it can't really be for the people who like the video game but then again it's so marketed towards seem like it's for people who don't know the video game so, yeah um yeah Yeah, I think that's pretty fair. I haven't played the game myself, but I have watched uh, playthroughs of the game to get a bit of a handle on it. Because when this was first announced, I was super sold out like crazy. And I'm glad I didn't because uh, I would have ended up playing customs and it has made it into retail. But now it's in retail and I've watched it being played and had a bit of a look at it and cooled off from the excitement of, oh my god, it's Stardew Valley. I'm like, this isn't Stardew Valley. This is, this is some other cooperative other cooperative worker placement ish kind of game which has taken stardew valley and peeled all its flesh off and popped it on it's it's a completely different creature underneath there's the aesthetics and not a lot else that i've seen i i do think there's some nice looking stuff i like the trees changing each season nice looking stuff i like the trees changing each season until i don't know if there's a mechanic behind that <laughs> well yes there's a mechanic and the mechanic is that basically four times during the game you have to remove all the uncover not uncover tiles and replace the tiles again with the new season so um the tiles again with the new season so um it's a nice idea but again it's it's too much <laughs> does it have any like mechanical benefit for the trees changing um well yes and no i mean the the only really um i think there are four of these trees that yield wood with each season so if you collected the wood and the new season comes they regrow basically um but apart from that i mean even with the crops there are crops for each season um yeah. I mean, the just different names and artwork. Mechanically, they are the same. So, hmm. yeah, it's it's a lot of micromanagement of all the different aspects of the game, and it's it's something that's fun when it's handled by a computer, but maybe not as fun when you have to uh, manually. Uh, maybe not as fun when you have to uh, manually uh, move things around. Yeah. So, um, personal f um, thoughts. It. Uh, what, what's part of it in English? Um, conclusion? H hit and a miss. It's it's too bad because I think that like a... It's, it's too bad because I think that like a, a chill cooperative worker placement game uh, about making a, a, fa a farm could be a really fun game. Like I, I would love a cooperative worker placement that um, that, that feels uh, homely and... and uh, it feels uh, homely and, and uh, easy to play with uh, with family. Yeah, I think the, the the problem here is really the time aspect, and I guess the only way to translate the chillness of Stardew Valley into board game would actually be to make a small campaign-ish game, like season, and the next time you play the next season, um, so you can do more during one season and you don't feel so so hurried along the way yeah 
I was just uh, like I'm looking at the playing time on Board Game Geek and they have it listed at 45 minutes to 200 minutes with a weight of time. I generally expect to see a weight of 3.5 or higher, you know, approaching 4. But f- yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea of a simpler version with, with the campaign stuff. Like mini legacy type effects, but you reset it all once you finish and you just go back to the beginning. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. I I only played it once. I thought it was enjoyable, but it, it felt like way too much micromanagement. And, and definitely, as Kara uh, pointed, yeah, not not really like the, the game. But it, I I would be interested to see another game by um, uh, Cornered Ape, another game by um, uh, Cornered Ape uh, that refines those ideas a little bit, maybe with the different themes or that, that make them feel a little bit more homely just i would be i would be into some uh, something like that especially since they're working on a uh, another game that seems like it would fit also uh, another game that seems like it would fit also um uh, witching school game if i remember correctly anyway th- thanks for uh showing us the game car um at least that uh, <laughs> that that uh helped me solidify the idea that maybe i'm not going to yeah, it, it really helped me be like, you play it once, get frustrated with it, and then it'll go on a shelf. I mean, if you want, I can take it with me when I visit. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to play it is what I'm saying. I really don't want to play it. Uh, I, no, no. I'm, I could live my life with just a video game. They're absolutely fine. And maybe then um, better uh, or tighter. Hmm. Okay. Um, so that was Stardew Valley colon The Board Game 2021 edition. Um, so we're going back. As I realised, I thought it was just... Um, it turns out this game's from 1997. It is... Um, instead of farming everything, you now farm nothing but beans. And it is Bonanza, the portmanteau, uh, by Uwe Rosenberg. And this is... I was trying when we talked about in the Discord, like what? When I have, the, I have memory of being a, a a young child and being not super young, teenager, and being in my local friendly gaming store, which is called the Trading Post at the time. It's sadly shut down since. Um, and we played this. We played the German edition of Bonanza. It was one of those games in the upstairs of the shop and passed the time with the, some of the staff and whoever dropped in and out. So, Bonanza has really... It's 25 years old, I think, at this point. And it was Uwe Rosenberg's first game. Um, I believe he... Really li- um, I believe he really liked playing Civilization, but he it was too long and too much. And the bit he liked most of all was the negotiation. So he went, I want to take the negotiation out of Civilization the board game and make something else and definitely could have made this is a what better joke about uh, and definitely could have made this is a better joke about uh, caverna earlier then mm-hmm. just uh, i didn't know that it was uwe rosenberg sorry it for is. interrupting you no no it's fine it's it is it's his first board game uh it's why he met, it was a path fork in his path through life and he decided to not follow on with his university de- and he decided to not follow on with his university degree career um and become a board game designer and um he hit gold with this first game in my opinion so i'll get back onto that with a little bow wrapping up after we talked about it a bit but part of what I like is how easy it is to teach a bit. But part of what I like is how easy it is to teach. With only one thing that new players get a little bit wrong and you just have to remind them because of human habits. So it's the deck of cards. All these cards have uh, pictures on them that represent various beans. Um, the, the art is something we'll talk um, the, the art is something we'll talk about in a little bit. It's idiosyncratic, I think, is the best way to describe it. And there's some jokes that didn't translate into the English language. So, we have, uh, you have a deck of cards um, with all these beans in. And on the back, the various different beans. And they have, below at the bottom section, a number of, uh, a number of, car- of beans of that type that you need to have. 
before you can make money from them. And that's the concept there. When it comes to where you plant them, you have two fields. You can, you put all the same beans of the same type in one of the fields and you can have a different field with other beans in. And later on, you can spend money to get a third field to give you more options, but it actually costs quite a bit in this game and there's an interesting dynamic there. So with that rough, loose outline of what's going on, here's how the, ga here's how the game flows. First of all, on your turn, after you've first, first player, they've got five cards. You will plant a bean. So you have to take the first bean in your hand and you need to keep your hand always in the order it's been dealt to you. So it doesn't matter if you found the cards left or right, but you all be moving from the frontmost card to right, but you all be moving from the frontmost card towards the back. So that's a forced plant. You have to put this bean and plant it. So you, if you've got two fields that you really don't want to get rid of and you've got this bean in your hand that it doesn't match either one of them, you might have a bit of trouble here and it may end up forcing you to harvest a field that doesn't trouble here and it may end up forcing you to harvest a field that doesn't give you any money. Pretty bad. Then you can optionally plant your second bean. That's nice because it's a choice. Uh, you're not forced to if it doesn't match what you have down on the table already. You have down on the table already. Then, after that, you draw two beans from the top of the deck and put them down face up. And these are the beans that you have on offer or you can keep. And this is where the big part of the game occurs. Now it's trade keep and this is where the big part of the game occurs. Now it's trading and negotiating time, but people can only negotiate and trade with the person whose turn it is. So you're in the spotlight when it's, this is here, you're there, you've, you've got these two beans and you've got whatever you've got in hand. And everybody is always looking at deals of some kind, or almost always, simply because when you look at your hand, say, say I've got like one soybean and three um, blue beans, I don't have, I can't get any money if I harvest these. And if, if my soybean is my third card down, I've got two cards in three. And that's, these trade negotiations can go up and down all over the place, starting as far as donating, where you can go, look, um, I don't want this. You do, you can use it. So can I just donate it to you? And no strings attached, or maybe you'll donate something to me later, but whatever. Uh, and that's, it's, it's so much fun because, and also, Everybody has to listen to the player whose turn it is, and you're constantly involved in the turn because you're looking at what they're planting, you're looking at what they've drawn, you're looking at how many cards they have in hand, how many coins they've got, because at certain, a certain point you don't really want to be trading to the person who's leading the game, or you want to be getting good deals from them. Otherwise, they're just going to close. Once everyone's done all the trades they want to, the person whose turn is uh, will plant whatever's left in the market into their fields. Sometimes they're forced to harvest stuff they don't want to, and... Um, other players who got beans in trade with the active player will also plant theirs following the rules for planting. And then last of all, you draw. I don't think Bonanza is a fantastic game two player. So that, in a nutshell, is what you've got. You go through the deck three times. Each time it's thinner because some of the beans have been taken out, planted into fields and turned into coins. And... Um, eventually, eventually, the end of the game just thunders up on you like a surprise, where you're, you're sort of, what, what, how are we nearly done? Why is nearly all of the deck gone? And that's because of the volume of cards, how they're drawn, and the thinning of the deck. I think this might be one of the games I've played the most over the years, because it's played the most over the years, because it's really easy to teach someone. And the only thing I find that players get wrong is they start trying to reorder their hand. Um, because it's a, it's unusual to have a game where you have to keep your hand in a set order. Hanabi does it. A game where you have to keep your hand in a set order. Hanabi does it. Um, and Bonanza. And I don't know many others that do. Anyway, so let's talk about the aesthetics, shall we? Because this one's a bit of a doozy. Um, every single bean has a name, has a number printed on it that tells you how many it has a name, has a number printed on it that tells you how many in the in that particular set. So some of them are quite desirable, like there's only four cocoa beans 
And if you can get all four of them and harvest all four, you'll get four coins. Um, but it has a piece of artwork on it that Kara only just explained to me uh, right before we... Kara only just explained to me uh, right before we started recording. And I, I didn't understand why the cocoa bean was experiencing what it was. So Kara, would you like to tell everyone? Yeah, so... Um... Keep in mind, it's originally a German game, so um, a lot of jokes are German. I don't know all of them, but um, the cocoa bean is uh, a picture of this bean holding on to like some rope and being dragged through a brown liquid. And um, in German, there is um, this, uh, you know, saying uh, to um, drum. <laughs> And that basically means, you know, um, um, playing a joke on someone. So, uh, yeah, the cocoa bean is being dragged through the cocoa. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know what else do we got. I mean, the red bean is pretty straightforward. It's... it's um, Best red, yeah. Uh, yeah, the soybean is... Um, it's, considering there's a derogatory term that gets thrown around the internet called the soy boy, um, he's a literal soy boy. Like, this yeah. is years before that came along. <laughs> yeah. He's literally a soy boy. He's got a, a hippie aesthetic going on. Yeah, because um, now that I think of variants and um, organic food stores and stuff, where they're pretty fringe in Germany, and there was a certain image attached to it, a certain aesthetic, how people dressed. So, yeah. <laughs> um the green bean is all in, in English it's the green bean and it's a picture of a green bean, you know, hanging on a, a street lamp and obviously having just vomited. And um, in German it's the Brechbohne um, and Brechen is either to break something or to vomit. So it's ah. the vomit, uh, vomit bean. Um. <laughs> yeah, and... I, I heard, citation needed, I heard that the German for blue bean is sometimes used as a slang for bullets, hence the blue bean being a cowboy. Um, Cara, you haven't heard that one. I have you? never heard that one. <laughs> yeah. So it's the most out there, because like the coffee bean makes sense. That, that thing is like, it's not a bean with multiple arms and legs, it's just moving really fast. Yeah. Also um, the um, Ackerbohne, I, I, I don't know what the, the English version from it is. Um, but as far as I can tell those, you actually get a new plot to plant beans. That's not in the um, English version, no. It's called a garden bean, uh, and it's a um, different artwork, and it has, um, the garden bean is just smashing the heck out of a flower that's turned up in its allotment. It's very violent. Oh no, that's an, like that's get... an other one. Uh, we also have a... In its allotment. It's very violent. Oh no, that's an, like that's get... an other one. Uh, we also have a uh, in the other one. garden bean, but there is an Ackerbohne, and Acker is, um, you know, basically a, a plot of farmland. Mm -hmm. And... Um... It's also the name of a dog nearby. <laughs> His name's Acker. And... Uh... As a... the name of a dog nearby, his name's Akka. <laughs> and uh, as a verb, yeah, um, Akkan can mean to work really hard. And if you look at the picture of this Akka Bona, it actually seems really busy working and planting stuff. So, um, um, yeah, I see that now. He's I'm looking at the picture and there's a three on it. So clearly it's not the same as the garden bean. This isn't in the English edition. This wasn't in the German edition that I played. I've never seen the, uh, that one before. Maybe it's in one of the expansions, but yeah. Um, Andy Bean? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure what's, what happened there. Uh, in German, it's the Weinbrandbohne, yeah, brandy bean. And it's basically a drunk bean. And yeah. for some reason, with translation, whoever did the English distribution decided that, nah, that's not child friendly. So I, I have to say it's very, it's a very strange uh, theme for a game that's all about uh, negotiation to decide to do like specifically beans. Yeah, well, um, the, the, the title is a portmanteau of, a, of Bonanza, uh, oh, sorry, of a Bonanza, or and it's a little bit tricky, a bit of a trip up to say in English, hence, hence my difficulty, because as soon as you start thinking of Bonanza and Bonanza, they are 
verbally quite similar. Um, also, I don't, uh, just to touch back onto that brandy bean, the green bean is clearly drunk and throwing up, so I don't... But yeah, it's it's definitely the wax bean because there's 22 cards, same as the wax bean. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a strange set of art for definite. I still kind of like it. I think Stink Bean in particular, I really like. He he. All right, I, I wouldn't want to be near him because he's stinky and he doesn't wash. But he but he is living life for sure. He's having the best time. He's got a little can of something. I want to think it's baked beans because it's blue. I imagine it's a drink really, and um, some kind of bar, and he's just he's just chilling out there. But the, it also puts a bit of a dark spin on it. You're like this farmer who... You've got, it also puts a bit of a dark spin on it. You're like this farmer who... You've got these living bees. He's anthropomorphized. Great pronunciation there, Fen. Um, uh, beans. Like the, and yet you farm them. I, I, it's just... It's a bit weird. It's like, why are all these beans alive? Why are they... A bit weird. It's like, why are all these beans alive? Why are they cool with what happens to them? I, I don't get it. I don't know. But I also kind of... Well, I don't think I'd ever change the artwork. Ever? The stink bean uh, definitely feels okay with it because I think that the stink bean is okay with whatever happens in life. Okay with it because I think that the stink bean is okay with whatever happens in life. It just don't make him move anywhere. I keep handing him food and he'll be fine. Yeah. And, and they're trying to harvest the blue beans. You know, they're... they're um, that's a bit of a wild one. I know they did a Wild West themed expansion, and I think uh, that's a high school high noon. I think Bonanza High expansion, and I think uh, that's a high school high noon. I think Bonanza high noon. Um, I'm just going to say outright, there's a lot of expansions for Bonanza. If you are interested, just get the core game. I, I've I've had the core game since before I went to university, and I've never had a desire to get it. To play any to play any of the expansions, I did get them. Um, I got a lot of them actually, and never opened a single one of them to play with, and then sold them before moving to Sweden. So, uh, the the main game is just fine. It's just good enough. It's a neat negotiation game that I don't think has has been surpassed because that that and really drives so much of the drama and the impetus and and like plot of a game. Um, one of the things I didn't touch on well in the opening section uh, is that you can vary the number of beans in the deck. And in fact, you're supposed to when the number of players changes of the wax beans and the like, uh, was it? There's another, another one you should cut the, maybe the chili beans or the cocoa beans. But anyway, you cut like a couple of them out and the game suddenly really, uh, speeds up and plays in a faster time frame. Um, uh, and not the other question um, that I wanted to ask. I think even a learning game is done. Oh, is it? Oh, Akabon is in High Noon. The box I bought and never looked in. So that's why I didn't recognize it. Um, Playtime. Uh, they haven't bought Game Geek for 45 minutes. Um, I think, like, with five, four or five, especially if you take more of the beans out to speed it down, speed it up. That's, that seems interesting. It's, a, it's definitely like a very. Um specific game to make for your first game like specifically a negotiation game which isn't the most common around and uh on top of that a mechanic i think that's that's a you know a proof that uh, uh ua rosenberg was um you know a good designer from the start yeah um he's put other good designs out which are well regarded I put this in his top three designs. I think this is one of his best three games, and it's definitely the game. This is one of his best three games, and it's definitely the game I've spent the most time playing and played the most number of times. And I would love to see him revisit this and just give us another light kind of negotiation game with some variations and improvements based on everything else he's learnt. Uh, but even if he doesn't, based on everything else he's learnt, uh, but... Even if he doesn't, um, Bonanza, I think, is a modern classic. I, I just can't see uh, losing it from my collection. Not by choice. It's No, no I'm curious about uh, what your other two are for this top three. Also, just noticed uh, what your other two are for this top three. Also, just noticed that he apparently made another game about Bean in 2002 uh, called Bean Trader. Uh, so, yeah, Uber Rosenberg definitely has a thing for Bean. 
He has a thing for beans and he has a thing for farming. Um, well, personally, uh, my top three are uh, a feast for Odin, um, and uh, a feast for Odin, um, and then Bonanza, and then Halatau. Um, and sometimes, if I'm feeling a bit spicy, uh, Bonanza will get to number one, which is where it is right now. Whenever I'm reminded how much fun I have playing it, um, but I was like. Many people will point to Agricola, which I I think does a wonderful job of letting you know how miserable farming life was in that period. Because I, I, I always feel sad when I play it. I think the Caverna is the better version of Agricola. Yeah, I, I, keep, I keep looking at Caverna and I'm like, oh, am I getting that? But it's it's like, how many pieces, how many players does it cover? Like six players? Sorry? How many yeah, players? Up to seven players. Seven players. Yeah, yeah. Um, no. no I, I keep I, taking I out received, the basket. I received the box and it, it's it was around twice as heavy as what I expected. Uh it's it's a massive uh heavy box. And mostly because it, it feels and it looks great, uh, but it's definitely uh it, it's a game that I, I bought once because I was planning to have a game night and uh I, I didn't plan on, on reading the rules beforehand and I got I, I got pushed back and I ended up taking like an hour to read the rules and we ended up playing something different. Uh, definitely not a good we'll learn it along. Um, that was a bad idea at the time. But I, I I've since read the rules outside of that and played it multiple times and it's it's my it's my favorite uh, real world game board game because it just does everything that Agricola does but less miserable and it doesn't feel like you're all uh, constantly competing. It feels a little bit more uh, chilling, interesting. Yeah, uh, I'm also a big fan of Dwarf Fortress. Hmm. That that is that is why. Oh oh, sorry, Nisfjord actually um, is the other one that floats in around my top. Nisfjord's really good, and same thing. It's not mean. It feels generous. If some eventually you are collapsing under a tide of fish, that's how generous it is. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, Ca Caverna is definitely something I've ummed and ahed about for a long time. But yeah, that was Bonanza, so it's time for us to leave the fields and get over to our last stop in this podcast, which is a table in a crowded sushi restaurant, and it's going to be Alexis who's conveying sushi, sushi restaurant, and it's going to be Alexis who's conveying sushi go to us. Uh, specifically, specifically conveying, because the whole game is set around the idea of a sushi belt, a sushi conveyor belt. Uh, Sushi Go is for me the perfect template for a uh, good traveling. Uh, the perfect template for a uh, good traveling uh, card game. It's a drafting party game made by uh, Philip Walker Adling. It costs around ten dollars and fits in the pocket. Uh, you can play it between two and five player, uh, but I've played it uh, with up to seven player by. Uh, but I've played it uh, with up to seven player by altering the rules a little bit and it worked perfectly. It's uh, honestly one of the best bang for your buck that I have in my, um, in my board game collection. So the game is extremely simple to explain, uh, especially if you have the cards in front of you. The game is extremely simple to explain, uh, especially if you have the cards in front of you to, to explain them to other people. But um, Outside of that, uh, it's very easy to explain to. So basically, each player has a hand of 10 cards. Um, on each card, there's a different type of sushi. Uh, on your turn, you pick one, you turn, you pick one, you put it in front of you, and then you pass you on to the... Well, on each turn, every player picks one card, put it in front of them, and then pass their hand to the next player. Um, when you grab the hand of the player before you, you reveal the card that you picked on the last round. And this continues until every card has been put down. Uh, then, so each sushi gives you points according to different criteria, and usually you need to collect uh, sets uh, or to have a different uh, some type of combo. So, for example, um, Mackie's uh, will give you a certain amount of points if you are the the player that has the most of them. You are the third. So usually at the table you're going to look around what type of uh, sets the other player trying to collect and try to uh, change your strategy according to that. So, uh, and especially since the hands are going to rotate multiple times in between uh, every player. So you kind of have to make your strategy. Once your hands went around the first time, you'll know how many of each card there is in, your, in, the, in, in the game. And so you can 
plan around this to see, okay, I'm not going to be able to get the most Mackie, so I can go for Tempras, where Tempras mark point if you have uh, three of them. Uh, so it's it's a gamble, all three, uh, uh, then you get, uh, you get a bunch of points. There's um, a few different types of cards. I think that two of them are very interesting. You have the baguettes that are worth no points, but uh, at any time you can uh, take the baguettes from um, your plate, so in front of you, put it back into your hand and replace them with a, uh, with a card. So on your turn, you're going to pick two cards instead of just one and put it back the baguettes into the hand. Uh, the thing is that if you are the last player with the baguettes, they're worth nothing. So you kind of have to plan. Oh. Yep. Uh, sorry, sorry, Alexis. Nothing. So you kind of have Hang to on. plan. Oh. Yep. Uh, sorry, sorry, Alexis. Um, what, what are these you're describing? Baguettes? Uh, the baguettes, yes. Oh, oh, in uh, chopsticks. Yeah. Like okay. That. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking like baguettes are, are French. No, um, I, I, <laughs> I didn't. I don't, don't eat sushi, or even the sushi is super popular in Sweden. I, I didn't. I don't, don't eat sushi, or even the sushi is super popular in Sweden. I, uh, I, I know fish. We do that. not. Um, we do not eat a baguette with sushi. <laughs> Yeah, I was just like thinking, that. like, I was, I was uh, like, chopsticks. baguettes, baguettes? There's something yep. there with a pair of baguettes picking up sushi is quite an image. But okay, chop, chopsticks. Yeah. Chopsticks. Uh, I know, yes. I'm so, with you now. Yeah, yeah, you, you put the, 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 the chopsticks because they're worth nothing. Uh, there's also this dessert, which you, uh, if you have the most at the end of the game, you get some points, not that many. So you don't really want to ogle all of the desserts. But if you are the player with the least desserts, you lose points. So you kind of have to play the game thinking of that not uh, end up being the being left uh, behind. So the game is really great, really fun, especially since it plays in uh, 20 minutes ish. Uh, I usually end up playing multiple games because it's just so fast and fun. And once uh, learning the game is really quick, really quick. It takes basically five minutes, uh, maybe one game to to get the, the feeling of the game and then everybody can, can just enjoy it. Um, and there's also like a few different variants that you can play of the base game once you're used to it. For example, um, I think last year, uh, Fen once you're used to it. For example, um, I think last year, uh, Fen uh, talked to me about uh, a variant for the game, which is- Sushi, which is no. The, Sushi yeah, no. To, to collect the, the least amount of points, which is extremely fun with players that are used to uh, Sushi Go because then they can calculate how to minimize the amount of Sushi Go because then they can calculate how to minimize the amount of points that they dealt get in their hand. Um, it's really, really fun. I, I love to play it with families and friends. Uh, it's great with three players and up. The game can be played with two players, but um, for my interesting, because you, with like every drafting game, you kind of lose the um, uh, the strategy of having the, the your hands having an unknown uh, at some point. If with only two players, it's it's very quick. Yeah, um, I, th I thought it's nice to put a little bit of historical context into this, in that this try Magic the Gathering, um, and that was always groups of eight who were drafting from 15 card boosters. Then you draft, open a booster, 15 cards, pick one, pass it to the player to your left. And then the second booster you open and pass to the right. And the third booster you open and pass to the left, just like Sushi Go. So um, that's what that's like. They, they took that mechanic and then put this cute little theme on it. Why are the sushi alive? Why were the beans alive? Why is the sushi alive? Well, you don't know if they're alive. They just have little eyes. They might have just been um, uh, painted in by the uh, by the cook. Yeah, but what what uh, what's the uh, painted in by the uh, by the cook? Yeah, but what what's uh, what's it well, with humans actually, my version, cutifying my their food? <laughs> they're extremely extremely cute, uh, cute little sushis. Um, yeah, it's definitely a game that I would recommend if you play often with. Um, more casual and if you play often with um, more casual players in a in a non uh, pejorative way it's just if you if you often find yourself with uh, people that want to play a 30 minute game instead of a five hours um, round of uh, twilight imperium then uh, sushi go is definitely going to be good. it's a you nice often, so um, yeah i have i have yeah. i played it so much when i got original sushi go i actually played a fair amount two player which clicked for us quite nicely 
Um, but then last year I decided to get Sushi Go Party, um, the Game Right uh, Games Edition. Um, and I made Sushi Go with um, one of my nieces and she really enjoyed it. So I gifted her the old Sushi Go um, and kept the Sushi Go Party. So she's got the small travel size fixed version she loved she loved the way the sushi looked they, she was constantly like they're so cute they're so cute i want all the dumplings wonderful it really she gr grasped it quite quickly um uh, struggled a little bit with how to score well on points um but you know she's she's not that old but she was she, she's not a teenager yet so she was able to still grasp it and understand everything that's going on enough to do fine she was just sad she couldn't win that's going on enough to do fine she was just sad she couldn't win um but then you know who, who cares really winning the yeah, game isn't the point yeah no it's not about uh winning specifically yeah that's what I winners think. say yeah. <laughs> yeah um so i got so i got sushi go yeah um so, so i got so i got sushi go party and i'm immediately gonna let you hear i can hear the box it's a tin don't don't make board game tins unless like they're small and pocket size and traveling i hate this tin i hate this tin so much i want a li I, I, I want a in this game you do get a board and the board has um slots where you put different tiles so the reason for that is you build your menu at the start of the game and you build it with you always have nigiri you build it with one roll two specials three appetizers and one dessert and why am i holding this up and pre presenting it presentation yeah so it has a ton of options it has all of the stuff in the main sushi go but it also has an edit well it has eight appetizers three different rolls three different desserts and eight different specials um plus uh, uh, you have a little scoring track so you don't need a notepad the game's significantly less but it does go up to eight players it has some menu designs that are like this is good for eight players uh, this is good if you want to play like a really high scoring game so everyone can have big big points and feel great about it uh, or this lot if you want something really mean and like where you just sort of constantly battling with everyone over the stuff so where you just sort of constantly battling with everyone over the stuff so very customizable experience um so you have to you just have to make the decision and it comes down to do you want a cheap travel game that you can take to the pub or you know out for a coffee or wherever have it you know out for a coffee or wherever have it in your picnic basket just something to pick up and play when out and about or if you um want the more variety because you play the game so much that mixing things up is the delight but i don't think well, you really need party i i'm going to assume that you can definitely like um I, i'm going to assume that you can definitely like um make your own like ready deck for party and just take it in a in a deck box or something and just uh, have it as a travel thing. Yeah, you uh, certainly it, could. It, it's also uh, not very expensive. Uh, I, the the base game is um, I think ten uh, ten dollars uh, ten dollars ten euros or something around that. And I think that Sushi Go is maybe thirty. Um, I, I you can see Sushi Go going for anywhere between fifteen to twenty five euros ish um yeah so it's it's not an expensive game yeah that's uh that's what i like about it is that it's it fits well the, the, the that price point with the uh the time played it's it's a great gift uh for someone also as a as a board game um, because it's it as long as the person likes to play board game with other people uh they're definitely going to enjoy it as a it's like a it's a very uh, universal one yeah it is uh, i'd like to quickly um point out so that much to my frustration there is a dice based version of the game it's my frustration oh. because this is combining the sushi go aesthetic which i really love with some really pretty um like dice very um with a lot of bunch of yeah this little maki and everything and nigiri you, you showed it you showed it in the in the chat and it, mm -hmm. it also comes with a little trays to put your your day in it looks so cute. Uh, I, I definitely might just be great. It's got a reasonable like uh, reputation as well. Um, go. Um, so uh, I think it runs. Yeah, it runs up at f f two to five players, and the best seems to be four players. Oh, 
and because they're dice, you could actually uh, use chopsticks or baguette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you to, could get out your, your dice. Get out your old stale baguettes <laughs> and pick up those dice. Fantastic. Oh, I might actually uh, buy myself this roll because it looks really fun. Maybe uh, that's the topic that will uh, I will uh, bring up uh, at some point. I tell you what, you do that and you try and sell it to me. You try and sell me on it. Noting that I'm already favorably disposed towards the game because of the art and it being a, a drafting game um, and a dice game. I like it. There we are. If you do get it, talk about it and I will listen and decide at the end if I'm going to buy it or not. We can do a whole thing where you pitch it to me and I'll tell you at the I end. I will definitely uh, bring it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll shark right. tank it. I'll either give it a yes or a no. <laughs> Well, uh, you you are already the one that recommended to me uh, Fleet the Dice Game uh, while I was recommended to me uh, Fleet the Dice Game uh, while I was a fan of uh, the card game. So I I am going to do a reverse uh, Uno card on you then. <laughs> reverse Uno card, yeah. Okay, well that um, that's Sushi Go, and uh, I think for the price, it is everything it needs to be, for sure. It, for the price, it is everything it needs to be. For sure, it's. Uh, I'm very happy to have it in my collection. Um, and if you haven't got a lot of space, the the original game, the small box game, is fantastic, and it's got many many hours worth of enjoyment. Uh, especially the fun of exploring, putting together different point scoring pieces. Fun of exploring, putting together different point scoring pieces. Which yeah, is... I, I, I think that um, the design is really tight. Like it, it doesn't feel like there's any any slack in the the way that the game is, is laid out. So uh, that's what I really like about it. It feels it feels very, like someone took an idea. It feels very, like someone took an idea and made it uh, as well as they could, and and cut off all the at the edges and left a game that feels just uh, just just right. Yeah, it's also I like how quickly you get feedback on your decisions, so you can get better at sushi go very quickly because you go oh I'll, I'll take this uh, teriyaki and you need a second one and when you get it you're like yes i knew i'd get it because i'd seen this many passed around in in the hand before and i knew one of them would come back to me excellent and because you get that feedback you just immediately engage with what's going on you in the line is trying to pick because you don't want to be the rule of drafting is the person to your who's passing to you, you want to avoid being in whatever they're doing because they get the best picks and you get the dregs. Um, and you only get one pass um, in the opposite direction because it goes left, right, left. So your person to your left is and the person to your right is a person that you kind of get to dictate to a little bit, which is always fun. Um, yeah, so with that final grab of the chopsticks, we are out of time for this podcast. Thank you for listening to The Last Standee. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash or one word on Twitter, or you can subscribe in your preferred podcast app. There are so many, I'm not going to list them all. Uh, so it's farewell from Alexis. Uh, from Belgium, au revoir. Cara. From Germany, au revoir. And myself. And it, remember that the second E in standee is for...